Hello everyone. Today I'll be restoring this Matchbox 16C Gamel Mountaineer Snowplow from around 1964. I say around because Matchbox started producing these in 1964 and produced them till 1968 when they discontinued them and began producing the number 16D case bulldozer. Early versions of this model had gray wheels and other small casting changes compared to later models that had black wheels. However, the gray and orange color remained throughout the run. I get questions about the confusing numbering system Matchbox uses from subscribers that go to look up cars to buy on places like eBay. Matchbox only ever had 75 cars in their lineup. They would discontinue cars and replace them with new models. This number 16 spot has been shared with four different models. 16A was a trailer, B was also a trailer, you're looking at C, and D is a bulldozer. All of these only say number 16 on the bottom. The letters are added by collectors to differentiate between them. So looking up Matchbox number 16 will normally get you all four models when searching online. If you're into Matchbox and would like a good book that breaks this down and shows all the variations, let me recommend a book from this video's sponsor, Audible. No, I'm just kidding. The book is called Collecting Matchbox Regular Wheels by Charlie Mack. It's a great book if you're getting into Matchbox regular wheel collecting with tons of pictures and info. It has a price guide, but just like all price guides I've seen, the prices are a bit over the top. But I'll leave a link below if you're interested. Alright, so let's take a look at this 16C snowplow. The paint is heavily chipped and the exposed die cast has some oxidation. You might have noticed that the gray paint on this particular model is very light. More about this later. The plow's a bit bent and the wheels are a little worn, but everything is here. Marty restored one of these some time back and it had a missing plow, which is pretty common. Kids could break them off and play and I would guess that a lot of kids purposely remove them to get a plain dump truck. I've actually restored several of these without the blade just because you can't really tell it's missing based on the design. Once I get it apart, I'll use Marty's method of axle removal to pull these axles. They're in good shape and I plan to reuse them. The axles do need to spin for this to work. Also, Matchbox axles have two different ends, one that is large and the other that is much smaller. You want to grind off the smaller end for what should be obvious reasons. I'll go ahead and use the same method to remove the pin in the back holding the bed in place. I had to be a bit more careful here as to not grind the other parts of the truck. After this, the truck is pretty much apart other than the friction block in the back that is easily removed now that the bed is gone. Now I can go about removing the paint. I'm using the new aircraft paint remover, the one without methylene chloride. This is due to several tragic cases of not reading the label, and why we can't have nice things. But it works okay. I still have about a fourth of a can of the old, so I'll set that aside for jobs the new stuff can't cut. Just in case nobody's told you, you should only use paint stripper in well ventilated areas, and you should read the labels on chemicals before using them. The paint stripper does the majority of the work, but there's still some paint in the corners and the recessed areas. To remove this paint, I'll use a dental type pick. I'll also use some brass brushes to clean off the oxidation. Once I'm sure the paint is gone, I'll go about cleaning up some of the casting marks. This is one of those sort of touchy subjects. If you completely remove them, you're altering the model away from its original look. However, removing them usually nets a better looking vehicle. You have to weigh each of these points for each vehicle you restore. I plan to slightly alter this truck later, so I don't have much of an issue removing some of the casting marks. Now is also a good time to work on the blade. You can see that it's bent. I first tried to just bend it back in place by hand. This didn't work at all, so I switched over to a plastic hammer, which did take out a large portion of the bend, but not all of it. So last, I switched over to some plastic jeweler's pliers to fine tune everything. In the end, I was able to remove most of the bin, but not all of it. Diecast sort of work hardens. If you bend it one way, you're fine, but attempting to bend it back usually ends up with a broken part. Right before that happens, though, the part usually gives you a lot more resistance than before. This is your cue to stop, because if you push on, you'll just break the part. That's why I couldn't get all the bend out. I was getting more resistance and felt a break was on the way. Recently, a company sent me some of this rust remover gel to use in my videos. I told them that most of the rust I deal with is not of the iron variety, but they didn't seem to care and sent me some anyway. I can tell you it does work great as I've used it around the house, but up until now, I really haven't had a reason to use it in my hobby. However, 
These axles are made of steel and the wheels have a small amount of rust stains on them. I figured now's my chance to try this out on camera. I'm sure it will clean up the axles, but what I'm interested in is will it remove the rust stains on the plastic. To use it, you need to apply it to a rusty item and then place that item in a plastic bag or wrap it. This is so that the gel doesn't dry out. I will set this aside and check on it in a couple hours. Now I'm going to go ahead and start painting the truck. Off camera, I sprayed on a coat of primer and then wet sanded it. I chose to go with Tester's Gloss Orange Paint for the bed. I normally don't use spray cans as they tend to apply paint too thick, but that's not a major issue here as the bed doesn't have any small details to cover up. For the cab, frame, and blade, I'm going to go with a urethane paint from the Redline shop. The original color was gray, and this truck seemed to have a very light gray compared to the other versions I've seen. I found that I really liked the light gray over the darker color and decided I would go for that shade over the original, which makes this a bit of a custom. One of the issues I have with Lesney is they did not recolor their models. They would reuse models from time to time, but in the four years that they made this plow, they only ever painted it gray and orange. Contrast this with Mattel, who came out with only 16 cars in 1968, but painted each model in, let's just say, eight colors. That's 128 different versions of the original 16 cars. Kids could choose to collect each model or each color of each model. And Mattel could sell multiples of the same casting. Lesney, on the other hand, has many models that they produce for several years, but in only one or two color schemes. It baffles me as to why they did this. Maybe it was because they had a printed catalog and wanted to keep the cars the way that they were represented in the catalog. I'm really not sure. If you're a collector of Matchbox, it sort of stinks that you tend to only have one paint scheme for each car. As someone that owns several copies of the same car in different conditions, when I go to restore one, I tend to want to repaint it in a new color, especially if I already have a mint model of that car. It's more fun to mix things up and create a new model. Anyway, that's the really, really long way of saying I tend to change the colors of Matchbox cars I restore. After the paint dries, I can start working on the blade. I need to apply the red and white stripes to it and chose to make it sticker. I couldn't really tell how Lesney applied the red stripes on the original vehicle. They may have been an early version of pad printing. I'm not really sure. Finding red and white stripes online was easy, so I didn't need to reproduce that. Toy Ploy uses a special label paper that you can print on that has a glossy texture to it. I picked up some of that many months ago and decided to use it here. To cut it out, I just modeled the shape in DraftSight, a free CAD software, and then sent that to my laser, which cut it out. Once it was cut and I was sure it would fit, I could peel off the backing and apply it. It's not a perfect match, the original had slightly more space between the red stripes, but it's close enough. So it's been a couple hours and the rust removing gel seems to have done its job. I'll go ahead and remove the parts and wash them in some soap and water. Getting a good look, I don't see any rust on any of the metal or plastic parts, so it does seem to work on rust stains on plastic. I have some future projects I can try it out on to further test it, but if you're interested in giving it a shot, I'll leave a link below. The metal parts do have a slight haze to them, but that can be removed with a little steel wool. To finish work on the wheels, I'll go over each with a Dremel buffing wheel and some Plastex polish from Meguiar's. The best way to do this is to place them on the axle to hold them and then go to town with the buffing wheel. You can see here how a polished wheel looks compared to an unpolished one. Okay, so now I'm finally to the point I can start putting things back together. This is also the point I start to sweat because I need to mushroom the ends of those axles without damaging the paint or bending the axles. The small pin that held in the bed was pretty easy. For one thing, it's much thicker, and second, it's much shorter, so the risk of bending it is much lower. You'll notice I'm using a small lathe to do the mushrooming of the axles. Marty uses a drill press, which more people probably have at home, so I recommend using his method. I personally like the lathe, as I feel like I have more control and a better viewing angle of what's going on. Um, both methods, though, work great. Alright, a few things I didn't show. I polished the friction rod on the bed. I figured over time it would wear the paint off, which isn't very appealing. So I just removed the paint and left it bare. I also bent the axle straight. The footage on that was not very interesting, so I omitted it. I really like the light gray color for this model. It looks more white here due to the camera's white balance, 
but it's a light gray similar to the original color of this truck. All in all, I feel like it came out nice. If you're interested in seeing the Matchbox catalog from 1967, I placed the footage of that at the end of the video. Back then, I assume it was cheaper to just have an artist draw, ink, and color the cars than to take pictures of them like they did in later years. The drawn images of the cars being used in the real world, I'm sure would get the kids' imaginations going back in the day. Check it out because it's a lot of fun to look through. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts below, and as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.